So we had uh, questions about uh, uh, migrants or, or the um, care houses in Poland, and then we had um, the legal responsibility of taking care of your um, parents and uh, the um, human rights in France, or how to access um, social rights or your services and care in France. Well, it's, um, it's rather easy. Uh, the system is complicated, probably because uh, we have a long history of, uh, of uh, policies for aging people. So, um, well, also French uh, accumulate sometimes uh, administrations, you know. So. But um, all what I presented here is rather new and um, some uh, specific initiatives facing the reality lead to build all those kind of offer, you see. So perhaps in gerontology, the multiple offer is normal. It's probably normal to have a multiple kind of systems. But you, the policy, is there to make it easy to access. And in reality, it's not, it's not difficult to access. Well, we are making official one entry for all, you see. The system, the strategy, the system of regulation, the funding is the same for all the kind of, of systems. So in reality, when you are beginning to be dependent, you are losing one IADL or two. The family is wondering what's going there. The person doesn't know how to do. The first step is to try by themselves to get some people to help you at home. But then, rather quickly, the um, social workers from the community, from the municipality, can give an advice and give an orientation. So the accessibility to the service is not bad. All right, thank you. Um, Severin, could you please continue with the uh, uh, question about German elderly moving to Thailand or Poland to get some care? Well, I, I've heard about it, and I think it's not, it's, it's not going to happen. It's not happening in a big number. I mean, it's happening. There are some, some homes for elderly in, in Thailand, and I'm not sure about Poland, actually, but uh, um, it's not happening in big, number, big numbers. People are moving from, from Eastern Europe uh, to, um, to Germany to actually care for the elderly in their households 24 hours, which is kind of paradoxical in a way if you think that um, our uh, elder genera older generation is between 80 and 95, so it's uh, actually the war generation, so the grandchildren or their victims are actually caring for the, uh, for the war generation in Germany, which is, you have to think about that. I mean, it's kind of extreme in a way. But it, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to do some research about um, we're sending all the people to, to Poland, but I'm not, I'm not quite, I think it's not, a, not happening in a big number. All right. Um, the third question was, um, uh, is there a legal responsibility for the uh, uh, children to take care of their parents in, in each of the countries? So if you all could uh, give your insight. Uh, yes, for Germany, yes. To a yeah. certain, certain extent, there's an obligation. Uh, the, the thing is, um, the, the, the payment of the insurance and the private money was, is not enough. Social assistance pays, tax, tax fine and social assistance. But um, before social assistance pays, um, families, has, uh, the, the children have to, to pay to a certain extent. Yeah, I, like I already said during my presentation that there's, there's no formal obligation on uh, family members, not even adult children, to uh, help or pay for the care um, of their older parents. Um, but I think it's quite 
it's actually more important to look at what, what is happening in reality than what is the, the letter of the law, because, um, as I said, the level of formal care provision in the home is so low, and it's so tightly rationed, de facto, that, of course, you know, for, for somebody with anything beyond quite minimal care needs, uh, the family has to step in. Um, also, in terms of institutional care costs, in reality, people used to give quite a lot of money to their parents to be able to cover that cost. Now, with the new um, Nursing Homes Support Act, there is no longer such obligation. Um, older people who are in care pay up to 80% of their own income, um, and only up to 80%. Um, and if the care actually costs more than that, um, it will be recouped up to a certain maximum percentage point from your estate after you die. Um, and you know that is another scenario that um, makes a lot of older people nervous because they like to leave an inheritance um, to their children, and and maybe also you know given that once again people are expecting the property market to recover and houses to increase in value again de facto some of the uh, uh, children of older adults are rather would rather contribute to the cost now. Than, than to wait for the parent to die and then you know lose possibly quite a large share of the inheritance um, through um, you know the sale and recouping um, of the costs from from the sale of typically the house because about 90 percent um, of people aged 65 and over in Ireland own their own homes outright so it's a very important asset um, so there's all sorts of complex ways in which even if you wipe away that obligation, or if you don't have it in the first place, as in Finland, uh, the family involvement can still creep in. So you really got to watch out. You know what what sort of incentives or disincentives do, do people have, and to what extent do they simply have to contribute, even though there's no formal obligation. Um. In Netherlands, uh, there are actually no uh, legal obligations if you don't consider these uh, very strong recommendations to take care of you and your, uh, yourself and others uh, and trying to help them as much as you can, but uh, not actually a legal obligation. But uh, it's written in, the, in all places uh, that you should take care of people. Thanks. In France, uh, it's a legal obligation to take care of your parents and your grandparents, but not your brother or sister. Uh, this is a very old law uh, from coming from the French Revolution. It's a strong law and sometimes gives difficulties for some families, but with our old Bismarckian system, we, we can have a kind of solidarity. And when the family is not able to, to, to aid, uh, well, the municipality and the department take care of it. Well, they are speaking, we are speaking in France um, about lowering that uh, mandatory uh, aspect. So it's sometimes difficult for people. But it's um, a strong tradition and uh, sometimes we have law problems with that. All right, thank you. And now questions and comments from the audience, please raise your hand. You can you can ask questions in English or in Finnish, whatever you prefer. Matti Mikkola from University of Helsinki. So, so the cutbacks are a general tendency in Europe, except of Germany. So I have a question for Severin Schmidt. Uh, German federal government promised to, to give four billion to the states. Did that happen already? How did they use it? But um, they. I don't know ex exactly what I think they um, promised to give some for, for the uh, some money for the for the pensions 
um, not for the for the care system. Um, there was some some drift from the from the, from the national federal government uh, to the regions, lender, um, for the costs of uh, retirement, uh, but not for care. Uh, the the federal government decided um, last year to increase the contribution to the care system from to from 0.5 uh, percent of the um, n not of the GDP, but um, of the um, uh, um, of the wages. So we have a Bismarck system. So 2.54 percent of the uh, wages are paid to the care system, and they, they um, decided to increase uh, this uh, this amount from to 0.5 percent more. And this is about six six billion euros per year. This was a decision made by the federal government, but um, there's no there's no more tax money going from the federal level to the uh, to the local level or to the uh, care system. I, I'm not sure if, if you're looking skeptical. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for the presentations, were very good, all of them. Um, I'm uh, from Vantaan and, and I'm a city councillor. And uh, uh, in Vanta, uh, we talk a lot about right to choose between the private sector and the municipal, municipal sector. And uh, for the patient, oh, of course, if we, th we think about on the side of the patient, the most important to him or her is to ge get the right care. Uh, I don't think that it's, it's for him or her is so important, is it private or municipal. But uh, the question is now uh, more maybe also somewhere else in Finland, we are giving now this uh, opportunity to uh, private sector enter the market of uh, home care uh, and, and care nursing of elderly people. And uh, nothing wrong with that. But I would like to ask uh, Mr. Severin Schmidt that you said that you also have a lot of private companies uh, also already in in the market and uh, the big question uh, for me or usually is it that uh, uh, how do you control the quality of uh, those companies giving this uh, nursing in, in, a muni, multi, in the government side, it, it's much easier, but I have seen a problem in that, that uh, it's much, much uh, more difficult to control the quality. And uh, how do you do that? And or if is the market working so well that people come aware about the good uh, players and about those players which are maybe not acting so quality-wise. Well, I, I think that's exactly the key question. I mean, um, I have nothing against the market in the caring sector, early caring sector, because there's there's one advantage that um, there's uh, there are a lot of providers in the market, so it's quite easy to get a provider to find a provider. That's pr that's the advantage. But the disadvantage is, of course, um, questions of quality and um, also of the uh, labor um, conditions of the caring uh, employees or the caring people. The thing is. Um, if you have a, like, a, like a private market in the elderly care sector, uh, there are a lot of companies, also big, really big company, international companies, investing in, in the German elderly care market, um, getting some good, um, it's a good investment actually, it's a, it's a, it's a really good investment. The thing is, why, why is it such a good investment if you have a system which is so dependent of, of labor force? So, so they're, probably, they're probably reducing cost at the, at the labor force. Uh, 
And that, that's of course, has an influence on quality as well. And to come to your question, the quality in Germany is controlled by the insurances, by the medical service of the, um, of the health insurance. It's called uh, Medizinischer Dienst, um, medical service, uh, controlling the, um, the, uh, the providers. Uh, and it's also controlled by the uh, regional governments, by the state governments. Uh, the thing is, the control is probably not enough. And um, they, they tried to, to introduce a system comparable to the te technical controls um, for cars, for example. And they tried to, to give some, some school, school, how would you say, um, school, school grades to the, to the providers. And it turned out that all providers are actually excellent. Um, they're all good. So uh, that's actually that's the biggest question. Quality is actually the key question of the, of the care system. And what we do, would say is that uh, the quality is, is also is always good if um, the uh, people in, in need of care has a family. Uh, the family has to watch at the quality of the care. That's that's the key issue. For, but that's not enough. Yeah, sure. If you're looking for um, an example of how quality is monitored in a system that that has home care standards and that has a very diverse field of providers, then maybe the the best case to look at is perhaps England because they do have a home quality monitoring commission, and they also have a very diverse uh, field of providers. I don't know an awful lot of it, but um, a lot of the standards are. They're sort of based on numbers that are quite easy to check. Uh, for instance, um, in the home care provider organization, what is the percentage of care workers who have you know, a certain level of qualification? And then the providers are obliged to ensure that you know, all of their care workers are at least registered to study for a qualification within six months of being employed by that organization. They also have guidelines about what is the ratio of coordinators to actual care workers. So within the organization, there's supposed to be somebody who, who is in charge of no more than X number of care workers who are reporting to that person. So it, it tends to be that code of quality, quality indicators that are a bit more to do with you know, numbers and organization. And they don't really tend to drill down very deep into the individual experience. Al although, again, I, I know that they try to be very transparent. And they, for instance, they put the results of these uh, regular inspections up on the internet. Um, so I, I would look at the, the case of England if, if you want to see an example. All right. We have still time for one or two more questions. And here's the first one. Yrjö <coughs> Mattila Kela. Uh, I also thank uh, uh, all presentators for very, very interesting knowledge we have received here, and uh, it's it's really interesting to to uh, hear how how similar the problems are in Finland, in Central Europe, and in, in everywhere. Uh, I have a small question about Ireland to Virpi. Uh, because I have understood that uh, informal care is, is central in Ireland, but I understood from your presentation that it has not so big role there. Uh, did I uh, understood wrong, <laughs> you? Uh, yes, because the, the vast majority of the care happens in the home, and nine out of ten people who are providing that care are unpaid. So, you know, that essentially means that they're either family members or, or neighbors. So yes, absolutely, it, it continues to play a huge role. Um, but it, there's also an emerging and growing class divide, which I was trying to illustrate with, with the cases of Stacy and Fred, in that you know, it's something that falls upon family members in the form of direct care provision, yeah, actually you know, performing, giving the care in the case of people from lower socioeconomic groups. Whereas um, in the higher socioeconomic groups, typically, you know, their adult children would be employed. They would be employed in, in quite high-paying jobs, including the women. Um, so, you know, the expectations of care from from family are becoming, you know, quite close to zero. Other than companionship and visiting and this kind of thing that we see I in Finland, um, and then the pattern you have in that group is um, private saving and private expenditure to um, 
either buy all of the care or to top up what they can get uh, from the public sector. And I, I think, again, you know, it's, it's a pattern that is quite widely shared. I think similar pattern is emerging in, in Germany as well, uh, where, you know, it's, it's not going to be the, the women with master's degrees earning 100,000 euro a year who are all of a sudden going to start looking after their parents. You know, it's, it's the ones for whom the opportunity cost of losing the income is, is much smaller or, or actually zero. You know, there are some people who are better off by becoming carers. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, there's, there's layers to it. It's, it's also a socioeconomic gradient um, type of issue. Anja Rita Katakoski. Uh, I have been living in France, so I know what it means to be a uh, Sunepatre Catholic. When there was this debate about uh, joining the European Union, of course, the encyclicals were translated into Finnish. So subsidiarity was uh, moved in that form to Finnish culture. And the whole question about who is family and whose responsibility it is. It's a question of women, of course, because it's women. You read women. You say family, you read women. So you need uh, gender literacy. And you were referring to the market, uh, labor market. Guess how it is in Finland if it's different prices for women's work, invisible work, and no prices at all. So I think it's a very relevant question, but it's easy to discuss it in English in Finland without gender. So I, uh, you already added something to it, but I was interested in how you see this big uh, uh, danger of sustainability gap is all us elderly women exploding somehow if not something is done to us. And that type of atmosphere I don't like. So if you have any remedies to that. I think I also would recommend the old French film La Vieille Femme Indigne. Everybody should see it to understand this problem. So any comments on that? Thank you for our culture. <laughs> um, Yes, it's a problem of women. Um, we need first uh, a, a global adaptation of the society for that problem. So we need to speak about that openly. This is the first step. And probably we should have um, an optimistic scenario. This is better. Uh, including technology uh, and uh, modernity of the, this important sector of economy. A, uh, economy and aging, are, uh, silver economy, is a very big part of economy. It's a new economy, can be a chance. And uh, even if we want to respect the humanity of that, the um, the help of innovation is probably one of the ways to, to grow and to be better in the future. Uh, innovation of the management of the care, transparency about what's going there. So this reduces the, um, the I would say, the maltraitance, the um, um, uh, neglect and uh, and um, uh, abuse, abuse and neglect. This is a real issue everywhere. So the technology may help seeing there. So people fear not to be disturbed by technology and cameras and so on. This may be an invasive problem. It's also a liberty. So it's a new ethical way, a new. Uh, low way to to innovate. So uh, there is probably no black and white solution. There are a lot of gray ways to take them uh, and, and uh, to be confident in the future and not to break society between old and young. So everybody has to be aware of that and think about that. 
Thanks for your remark. Well, this is actually not about, well, it's also about the long term care, but this is about the visibility of the woman, woman's work. Uh, in Netherlands, um, uh, nowadays, uh, most of the personal budgets, they are going for the children under 18 years old. And before the personal budget came there, because the personal budget can be paid for the parents as well. So uh, it was informal care, so it wasn't visible at all. So nowadays, uh, it's, uh, you, it's visible for the handicapped children when the women are doing that by these budgets. But uh, earlier days, it was... Uh, well, is invisible informal care. So I, I just wanted to add one thing, which is sort of more pertaining to the Finnish debate, um, because, um, as I said, I just came from Iceland, so I have a little bit of an understanding about what the current discourses are in the area of, um, you know, particularly care in the community. And I, I think Finland is actually a little bit exceptional in, in the Nordic group in... Uh, there is this emerging discourse of families have to do more. We, we really have to rattle the families into action. And I think you are right that, you know, that, that has the, the hidden possibility of meaning women have to do more. Just on the basis of the sheer demographics, I mean, the, the vast majority of men, when they die, they are married. And you know, in the period leading up to their death, when they need care, you know, the, the primary supporter is the wife or the, or the spouse um, or, the, or the partner. Whereas the, the reverse is the case for women. The vast majority of women, when they die, they're widowed. You know, the men have gone before them. So just on, on the balance of, of the sheer demographics in the oldest population, yes, you're absolutely right. It is women's work. And if you start to incentivize that, you are asking women to do more. I mean, there's no two ways uh, around that. And actually, one of the things I would love to find out is, you know, what um, is, is the balance in the current supports towards um, family carers, um, Omaishoitajat in, in Finland. It, it has to be massively gendered. Um, so, you know, maybe some of these policy trends that seem like they're new, in fact, you know, in, in some ways they're reinforcing uh, old gendered patterns which you know Finland would be would do well to be very aware of before going further down that route all right thank you so much uh, I think we're running out of time so it's time to wrap up the seminar uh, before that could we give one more round of applause to our speakers for their excellent presentations <laughs> I would also like to thank Laura for the uh, comments and our interpreters, and of course, uh, all of you who are here. Uh, the session has been recorded, and the recording can be found from our website, sorosafoundation.fi, sorosafoundation.fi, in the near future, maybe tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. Today already, okay, that's great. Um, uh, you get there. You can also find obviously some more information about us and our projects and our publications. And don't forget to get a copy of the uh, forthcoming elderly care report, which will be published um, early next year. And you can also find that from our webpage and probably on the webpage of uh, uh, Federation of Finnish Financial Industries, uh, Financial and Keskusliiton, Kotesivulta Löytyy, and and there there will all also be some uh, uh, printed copies as well. So get your hands on those. So. Thank you so much and have a good week. <laughs>